Hot Bob Yurkus. <laughs> and things are a little different this morning. You've noticed, I'm sure. We're kind of back to the way things were a little bit pre-COVID. Um, but the first thing we need to do here is spend a minute in prayer before we open God's word and hear it preached. So let's pray for God's illumination. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for life in your house. We thank you for the opportunity to open your word, to hear it preached in our hearing. We pray, Lord, that only that which is true will come falling out of the pages, the verses of your word, that we would see them planted deep in our hearts as seeds of the gospel, that we would see them grow and produce and yield according to what your spirit would have us be. I pray for your help, for the nervousness that I feel, and ask that you would go before us all this day. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Our text this morning is a long passage of scripture, and I hope that in the process of preaching through this, I'll be able to explain why. It's a very familiar portions of scripture. Um, many of the commentators say that the, this particular proverb is, is the most familiar of all of those in Scripture. But we're going to kind of go a little bit beyond that. Our text this morning is from the Gospel of Mark, the fourth chapter, the first through the thirty-fourth verse. Again he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching he said to them, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some feed, seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil. And immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you it has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside everything is in parables so that they may indeed see but not perceive, and may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word, and these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation and persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, Pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And he said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises, night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. And he said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which, when sown on the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. 
Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the things that you reveal to us in shadows and types and parables. We thank you for the way in which you've knit our hearts to be able to understand or not the great truths that you lay before us. We thank you for the way in which you revealed these things to your disciples, that in your word they might be available for us to understand as well. We pray that today you would sow seeds deep into our hearts, that we would be found to be good soil, that we would be found worthy, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit to grow and produce and, and be a part of that kingdom that is ever advancing in the world. We pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. A couple of little preliminary things I need to get out of the way. The, the first one is, this is the first of two, ser two sermons and a sh sort of a short topical series. We're going to skip a week because you're in for a real blessing next week, um, although the gentleman who's going to stand here doesn't necessarily think it's a blessing at this moment. Um, you're going to get to hear one of your elders preach the first sermon he's ever preached next Lord's Day on Father's Day. So uh, I'm really happy about that. I'm also trying to put a lot of guilt on him so he doesn't try to back out. <laughs> so we're going to spend some time this week um, on, on some principles that I believe are, are kind of hidden in plain sight in this parable and in all of the other passages that were around it and explained it and kind of doubled down on some of it and then gave us a view from a higher altitude of what was going on. And then... I want you to kind of consider maybe looking at these verses from a slightly different perspective than you're used to. And I'm sure everyone in this room has at one time or another heard at least one sermon preached on the parable of the sower. Sometimes it's called the parable of the soils, um, which I think is a little more apt to what's going on here because it's really about the, the soils. There's, there's not a lot of question about who the sower is or, or what the seed is. But most of the ink that's spilled, most of the hot air that comes from, from people over thousands of years preaching about these things and teaching about these things and just talking about these things has to do with the soil. And usually we think of it as something that has, pertains to the preaching <coughs> into the world of the gospel. But I want you cons to consider that there's a perspective of these same verses that apply to those of us in this room to the church of Christ at large. So what I'm going to ask you to do repeatedly through this is kind of figuratively put yourself in your mind's eye at the door of this church where we're used to looking at this parable and the explanation of it in terms of preaching the gospel in the world. I want you to consider that there's a way in which you can turn around and look within the church and we can see ourselves portrayed in the soil we can learn some important things that Christ would have us learn about him and about ourselves and about our walk by having that slightly different perspective. And then the next time we meet, I'm hoping to be able to expand a little bit on, on some of the things that have to do with gardening and, and tending the garden. So if you've ever thought that this was only about preaching the gospel out into the world, um, I'm, I want you to maybe consider that it can mean something else. It I'm not saying it doesn't mean that, because I believe that it does. But I think there are many meanings that are in here. We, we frequently think that when Christ uses parable to teach us things, it's to reveal things to our fallen minds, our idiocy, that we would not be able to understand if he spoke plainly to us. But there's a kind of a little... Easter egg hidden in the middle of these things, and I'll just give it to you right now. In verse 12, he quotes Isaiah 6, and he actually is making a point in verses 11 and 12 that these parables aren't to make it easier to understand for the people. They're to kind of make it harder, and he's needing to have his disciples 
um, understand, and then there's a purpose in which they're to take these things and then and then amplify them and teach on them later. Which to me begs the question about whether we're not also talking to to the the soil within Christ's field, within the garden, not only to the field that is in the world. There are also some um, basic things we need to understand. Christ always seems to be teaching things through parable. There's a... Did I just mute myself? I did. That's how dumb I am with these things. I'm not used to preaching into these kind of deals. Um, he, he preaches an awful lot of truth by parable. He speaks in analogies and metaphors and similes and, and all kinds of poetic literary tools that quite honestly, I think sometimes can trip us up. We spend so much time trying to, to find the little secret decoder um, uh, key to these things that, that will unlock some great mystery, when maybe there's just some very regular things that are going on. Some very normal life in, in the Father's field kind of truths that we should be getting out of these things. Um, but you always see Christ interpreting in some way what the parables mean. In the case of this one, he pulls his disciples away, and, and after the crowds have left, after he's alone with his disciples and those who decided to stay and bothered to ask, he explains the meaning of the parable. But he doesn't just stop at the end of explaining the parable of the sower or the parable of the soils, he goes on from there to tell them what the purposes of the parables in general are. And he also um, tells them the, this thing about hiding your lamp under a basket and another sort of a parable of seed uh, growing in general. And then he launches into this little picture of a parable of the mustard seed. So an awful lot of seed sowing going on, an awful lot of soil issues that are going on, an awful lot of speaking of heavenly future, to us historical and eschatological, to them future eschatological kind of things, truths that are taught through parable that are, are to be interpreted um, by Christ, not just things that are automatic in, in, in our own eyes. And then... So Christ then speaks in parables. He interprets the parables. We see this in verses 14 through 20, 22, 33 through 34. He exhorts his disciples about their own understanding and a need to better understand what's going on. Um, you see in verses 11, he says to them, To you it has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables. In verse 13, he says, do you not understand this parable? How then do you understand all of the parables? And then in verse 24, he says, pay attention to what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. And he, he just kind of continually doubles down on this need for the disciples of Christ, which, by the way, is you and I, to, to reach into, to dig down, and to try to understand these things. And there's a need for us to do it as well. He also spends some time opining about the need for parables to be used. Um, and as I said before, some of them seem to be so that very complex truths can be explained very simply to the way everybody can just see what's going on in the world around them. But in this particular instance... He, he seems to almost hide some truths in parable so that they have to be explained um, by the disciples of Christ. But there's a, a situation in which parables are necessary. They're, they're necessary to either reveal things or to make things um, harder to understand without explanation. And all of this, I want you to see is given in the context of the mustard seed, which is a picture, I believe, of the whole, like a 30,000 foot view of the history of the church, something that begins very, very small and tiny, and by the time he's done with it, it's this mighty tree that covers the whole earth. There's, a, there's very much a kingdom language issue that's going on there. And he also mentions kingdom language repeatedly, 
throughout all of these, these texts. So those are more or less the preliminaries. There's also some things that are, I think, are givens in this. As I said, I don't think there's much doubt about who the sower is. It's, it's the one who sows the word. Um, it's the ministers of Christ. Now, it's tempting to think that means the professional uh, ministers and preachers and all of that. But I don't believe that that's necessarily the case. That, because preachers aren't the only ones who preach the word. We preach the word all the time. We carry the word about us. If you belong to Christ, if you're numbered down in the soil categories as one that's producing 30, 60, or 100 fold, that means that there's fruit of the gospel that's coming out of your life. So you and I are sowers of this seed of the word of God. So the gospel is not something that is, and again, this is I'm trying to get you to see this pers from a perspective that includes all of us and doesn't give us the excuse to put it over under the responsibility of, of a professional class of priests and preachers and ministers so that we get to sit back and just drop a check to support missionaries in the in the in the, the offering plate or sit back and just say, well, I pray for them. This is about us being actively involved and, and being lively um, in our own participation in this sowing process. So the sower, although he's not specifically identified as professional preachers or teachers, and it's literally anyone who sows the word, it's a way in which um, we, we preach the word in speech, deed, and life witness. There's a really cool little quote. It's usually... Um, attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, but it's not. It's, it's not really in his mouth, but it's something that we hear a lot, and it's called, preach the gospel at all times, when necessary, use words. That's our life. We are preachers of the gospel. So whether or not this is something that has to do with the gospel in an evangelical sense only toward the world, or whether or not it's something about how the gospel inside the field of the Lord has a purpose and we're all supposed to be participating in that. We're all preachers, we're all sowers of the word. The seed also is, there's no question about what that is. It's clearly the word, the gospel. It's, it's explicitly in the text that we've read. There also, I think we should be considering that it's not only um, quoting scripture or, um, or preaching something that you carry around in your pocket like a sermon and you whip it out whenever you need to, to meet some, like, like a street preacher who has something specifically prepared for um, homeless encampments or, or for a, along a, a, a strip of bars or whatever, but a way in which anything that can be lumped into the general category of sharing the gospel is what's being talked about here that is the seed. They're the ordinary means of grace, which includes the word. It also includes prayer. It includes the use, the right use of the sacraments of, of, the, of baptism and the Lord's table. It has to do with discipleship and care for one another. It is some, anything that is generally used by the Holy Spirit, when manifest toward the elect, that will be used by the Holy Spirit effectually in time to bring that person to Christ. And we don't know what kind of soil the seed is going to land on. We can't know whether or not the person that we're sharing our life witness with or the gospel text with, whether or not they, they're, they're right on the cusp of of becoming a Christian or not. We don't know whether they're even able to understand. We don't know whether they're marked in eternity past by God in the column of the elect or in the column of the non-elect. We don't know. We can't know. We're in the business of sowing seed, not in judging whether or not soil is worthy of receiving it or not. It's something that we're responsible to just share. So it's the ordinary means of grace used by the church in the world 
by the church, within the church, that works in a way that saves or sanctifies. It brings a person into the kingdom, converts them, changes them from, from a... Well, we'll get into that a little bit later. I'm kind of getting turned around my own thoughts here. But, but there's no doubt of what the seed is. Also, um, there's really very little doubt that, broadly speaking, the term about the soils has to do with the hearers of the gospel, those upon whom the seed is broadcast. And they break into two general categories. The first category of soil is, I guess you would call it non-soil. Those people who are, are so hardened, um, either by reprobation, they'll never come to Christ, or because we all look like this at some point in our life, that time in our life before the Holy Spirit made our calling effectual, we all looked like the hard path. We all looked like asphalt. We all looked like concrete. In those, in those periods in our lives, seed would have bounced off of us, and it wouldn't have had any effect on us at all. And there are people who will never turn the knee. They will never come to Christ. Those are the people in that first category that I'll call non-soil. And then there are the other three types, which are all soil types. The, the soil types break down into rocky ground, um, soil among thorns, or what's generally called good soil. Um, Teresa and I were talking about it this morning a little bit, and, I'll, and it, it, it's tempting to read this parable and think that whatever kind of soil you are, you're going to stay that way. That rocky soil is always going to be rocky soil, and the soil among the thorns is always going to be thorny, and that the good soil is perfect. It's, it's nitro humus. There are no rocks in it. Weeds won't grow through it. It'll never be a problem, and that's just simply not the case. This is looking at a condition of soil in the moment that the parable is being preached. It's not something that is a forever situation. And we know that because of, well, hopefully what we'll get into in two weeks. Soil has issues because we live in a fallen world. Even the good soil, what ask yourself, what makes one soil able to produce 30-fold and another one be able to produce 100-fold? It, it has to do with, with the quality of the soil beyond being just good. Are there stones within it? Are there weeds growing up through it? There's an awful lot of, of soil treatment that can happen, but generally we've got two classifications. We've got non-soil and we've got soil of some kind. Now, I, I also have, I know you're twisting already, but I have a kind of a dilemma in my mind here too, because in my studies, I spend a lot of time reading a lot of commentators and what their opinions about these passages are. And you may be interested to know that in the treatment of the parable of the sower or the parable of the soils, which is also in the other synoptic gospels, Mark treats it as well as Luke, um, there's a kind of a debate about whether or not the call of the gospel is what's called an internal call or an external call. Is it only a picture of the way the gospel is being broadcast or is it something that's a, an appeal to the way in which the, the gospel has its impact or its, or its effect upon the soils? Um, and I want to suggest to you that there's a way in which all of those things, both of those could be true, and both of those could be looked at. So what we've got here in my little world of paradox is we've got the perspective, are we looking at the world or are we looking at the church? And I say yes. And then the, the other paradox of are we talking about an internal calling or an external calling, to which I also say yes. So we've got to kind of keep these things a little bit in our mind, um, ability to move them around on the table to help us to understand them a little bit more. So an external call and an internal call of the gospel are both being talked about here, I believe. As well as or whether or as well as whether this is a, a, a message for the for the world in general or for the church, um, 
And then as though those two little dilemmas weren't enough, I'll throw another one in the mix. And that is that your ability to see these things is going to depend upon whether or not your theological understanding of election has to do with whether God is sovereign in election or whether man's free will, so-called, is sovereign. If you believe, as um, much or most of the church today believes, that God's will is somehow, his sovereignty is somehow subject to our own, as though he wouldn't dare defy our will, then you believe that somehow the, the call and the, re, and the, the faith re, is, comes before election. That, you, that election is viewed from the, the side that you elect God. But if you believe, as, as Calvinists believe, that God's predestinating will made a, a, a decree of election in eternity past where he decided that he was going to set aside some for him for his own whom he called elect, and then the non-elect, we won't go into pre double predestination, whether you believe they're reprobated or non-elect, that's semantics, but um, then you believe that God, by his Holy Spirit, brings faith, the faith of belief, to the believer, to the elect, at some point in time, by a, by a grace that's only granted by God through the Holy Spirit by which God makes you alive. God, because of his electing decree in eternity past, at some point in your present, in your, in your life, the Holy Spirit comes to you and makes your faith alive and then all of the regenerating kind of things happen after that. I propose to you that only the one who has an understanding of God's sovereignty and predestinating election is going to be able to make sense of this parable in the context of whether it's an internal and an external call and whether it can apply both to the gospel being shared in the world or the gospel doing something in the midst of the church. It, it can't work otherwise. Only in our system of understanding God's sovereignty can you have a situation where if you're talking about inside the church that there can be a conversion or an apparent conversion from one kind of soil into another and especially from non-soil into soil only makes sense in the context of God doing that because this has to do with God's work because of the other things we learned about how the, the farmer sows his seed and then he goes to bed. He doesn't know how it all works. He doesn't have anything to do with it. The seed doesn't decide. God makes the seed do what the seed is to do. The, there's a sovereign act of God that's actively involved in, in regeneration and new life. So we're dealing with a lot of things. And I don't want us to think that this is not about evangelizing the world or um, somehow ignoring our responsibility to be sowers of seeds without regard to the, the soil that it lands upon out there, we are. We're, we're supposed to be, we're not hyper-Calvinists that think, well, if God's in control of all of this, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to, it'll, God will, if God is going to save everyone whom he elects, I don't have to do a thing. I don't have to lift a finger. I don't have to fling one little seed anywhere. The gospel will find its way, and, and the church has nothing to do. We just sit back on our haunches and wait for the kingdom to come. That's hyper-Calvinism, and that's wrong. We're supposed to be sowing these seeds, and we're supposed to sow them in the world, and we're supposed to be doing all of those evangelical things that we, we all are already in the mindset with this parable to think is what this parable is about. But I propose to you that what we're maybe not prepared to do is consider that this, this parable is talking to you and I. It's talking to you and I in this room and in our lives about our situations. Whether or not we have hardened our hearts to the point where the gospel seed can't get down into us and have a sanctifying effect 
that in Christ, what are we doing to cooperate with the gospel in our lives, the gospel purpose for the church in the church? How hard are we trying to become, to overcome being seeds sown in rocky soil that are choked out by trials and tribulations? How hard are we trying to overcome the thorns and the weeds of the temptations and the pleasures of this world to walk a walk of uprightness, to try to live into an image of Christ that we're supposed to spend our lives um, in an effort to be conformed into, and how much is all of that in the 30,000 foot view cooperating to, with the kingdom advancing and taking over the world? How does the parable of the sower, how does the seed of the gospel, how does a soil analogy work in this place? If you're standing at that door, looking inside, and wondering, how does this apply to me? then you're, to, you're going to be asking yourself about soil questions. You're going to be saying to yourself, gee, I wonder where I fit into this little analogy. I, I, hear, I hear the preacher every Sunday. I, I see, hear sermons in other places. I, I live in a Christian home. Um, I work with Christian people. I, I listen to to gospel music, I sing hymns and all of those kind of things, do they penetrate into the soil of your heart? Do they have the effect that the means of grace are supposed to have? So I'm the, the very simple message of today is a perspective. Have you ever stood at the, at the door of the church and looked at the parable of the sower as having anything to do with anything inside the household of God? And there's all kinds of field analogies and tilling analogies that beg the question about horticulture and husbanding and not merely just a wild life out there. It's a, it's a war field out there. It's a minefield out there. The field of the Lord is inside the doors of his church. How does the parable of the sower and other things that we'll be talking about apply to you? to I how, how how to me how does it how does it work inside this place what kind of soil are we it's a very simple question but it has very profound implications we are going to do some gardening um, and we're going to talk about tilling and hoeing and shoveling and moving rocks and raking stones out of the way. And we're going to talk about weeding and pruning. We're going to talk about harvesting and all of those kind of things. But that wasn't the purpose of this Sunday sermon. This Sunday was just to kind of get you to consider a few things. I'll give you a little bit of a preview of where we're going to go. How many of you have really just taken one tiny little baby step back from your New Testaments and consider it's written to the church. The letters, the Gospels, are written to the church. Nobody out there cares. They're, they're, the, they're the stony ground. They're the pathway. It bounces off of them. Talking to them is like talking to your driveway. Unless... <laughs> I don't know, maybe, I don't talk to my dad, right? <laughs> maybe talk to yours. <laughs> but it's, it's a futile exercise unless God has made some provision for what's out there to come in here. Your Bible is a series of love letters and owner's manuals. It's going to be a, a way in which you learn that the gospel, which is used many, many times in the New Testament, has just as much to do with you in your life on this side of salvation while you're walking in your sanctification, while you're becoming more washed and conformed and made into something beautiful. It doesn't only have to do with something that falls on the ears of those outside the church. I want us to spend some time then 
asking ourselves, how do we become a better field of the Lord? How do we become a garden that is beautiful, that produces, that is something that brings glory to God? How do we stop being so consumed with our own selves and the problems that we face, or being so fixated on the temptations that are before us in the world that we become useless as seed. We become useless as being part of that mustard seed growing into the tree that is going to take over the world. This little tiny series, with a break in the middle, has to do with us seeing that the term gospel has sanctifying implications for us as well. It's not mm -hmm. only about saving the masses, saving the world, bringing them inside, buying the world an insurance, fire insurance policy. It has to do with how we grow, how we become better, how we rake out the, the how we till up the soil, how we rake out the rocks, how we weed, how we we plant the seed deeply in good soil, how we produce 30, 60, 100 fold, how we put in the, the, the sickle and harvest it and share it, and it's something that grows and takes over the world. It's life in the Father's field. Put simple. I, I'm all over my notes, so I apologize for that. I do this all the time. I make notes and then I just kind of <laughs> lose my way. So we're going to do some gardening. We're going to develop this soil type analogy the next time. And we're going to um, we're going to look at ourselves a little bit in a way that is anything but selfish. It's going to hurt. It's going to leave a mark. You're going to have scars. And there's no way around it. That's what life is in the Father's field. That's what it means to be a church. And by the way, that little process makes you a seed bank, if you will, <laughs> for gospel external, outside the church work, because that's the multiplying effect. That's how, it's not just, you know, 12 disciples and that's all the church ever had. There are only 12 apostles, and that's as good as it ever got. It's a picture of reproducing, the seed reproducing sowers who then go out and sow in the world, and, and the church grows. And we grow in our growth in our sanctification. And we become more beautiful as this process goes on. You realize that your Bible is this really odd picture of... And, I, and I've preached the whole perichoretic thing in the past, how I believe that the Trinity and eternity past had it, perfect fellowship, they didn't need anything. But, but for reasons wrapped up within the Trinity, the Son and the Spirit together gifted the church to the Father as sons and daughters for adoption. The Father and the Spirit together gifted the elect, the church, to the Son as a bride. And the Father and the Son together gifted the Bride to the Holy Spirit as a temple in which to dwell. There's this beautiful picture in which there was a purpose in God to use us in some way to bring glory to, the, to them, to the, to the persons in the Godhead. But the picture of the Bible is this story of fallenness and unfaithfulness. And a, and a harlots, and concubines, and idol worshipers, and people doing heinous, horrible things all throughout history. And, all, and then the whole picture of redemption in Christ is this picture of God adopting, God marrying, the temple beautifying, making this ugly, whorish thing into a beautiful bride that's revealed at the very last days in the book of Revelation is this amazingly beautiful bride. It's a process. It's a process of sanctification. It's a process of making us be more and more conformed into upright children, beautiful bride, and a, and a, a 
solidly build beautiful temple? And how do we cooperate with that? Well, I think some of the answer to that is in the parable of the sower and what the epistle writers are going to do with it afterwards. So we're going to spend the next sermon going a little bit into maybe some of the particulars of application of what, what it looks like to do some work in the garden. But for now, I'd like you to please, in your minds, imagine yourself standing at the door of this place and looking inward upon our assembly. And ask yourself questions like these. Am I just now hearing God's voice calling me away from the hardened path of life, apart from God, to accept the seed of his gospel into the soil of my heart that's below this hard pan? And if that's the case, then I plead with you to hearken to that voice so that you'll find life. Ask yourself, what kind of soil have I become in my faith walk? And then seek diligently to get an answer to that question. Do a little soil inspection. Take your soil to the lab. See what it's made of. See what's in it. Look for an answer. Ask yourself, have I become undone by the very trials, persecutions, and tribulations in my life which God would use to refine me? Do I understand that the trials and the persecutions and the tribulations are things that God uses in that process of seed growth to refine and purify and sanctify me? If that's the case, then worship the God who loves you enough to not leave you alone in fallow ground, but God, the God who loves you enough to purify you through those very same trials and persecutions. Ask yourself, have I allowed the cares and desires of this world to eclipse the divine vision of the world to come with false idols in this fallen world? Have I become useless for kingdom growth here? Then repent and turn back while there's still time to be a different person. Put away those things. Go back. Weed, weed the thorns out. Try, work towards becoming the good soil. Above all, strive with your whole being to be called what the parable of the sower calls the good soil by your Lord. So that at the time of the harvest, you will be found to have been productive and to have yielded abundantly and to have been useful and good and, and beautiful and done everything that you can to be everything that God would have us be through examples like this parable. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity however dimly, to open your word, to see it before us, to maybe glean from it lessons that you would have us learn about you, and about the world, and about ourselves. We pray that you would help us to improve our witness, that we would be faithful sowers, that we would sow only the true seed, that we would be ourselves working diligently toward becoming soil that produces abundantly, that there is blessing for you, fulfillment for us, and grace abounding for your church and your kingdom as it grows. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.